Hey everyone, Rascal here. And Mama, welcome to our podcast. Today we're covering one of Miyazaki's masterpiece films. Porco Rosso. Yes. Now in this inspiring turn of a Miyazaki film, mm -hmm. in early 1930s era Italy, air pirates, bounty hunters, and high flyers of all sorts rule the skies. Mm -hmm. One of the most cunning and skilled of these pilots was Porco Rosso. A former ace, he now makes a living flying contract jobs such as rescuing those kidnapped by air pirates. But before we start, be sure to like, subscribe, and click the notification bell to get updates on future podcasts and World of Pause videos. Especially more Miyazaki films because we plan on seeing them all. Yes. And this is taking place during November, Thanksgiving month, and Miyazaki films are things we definitely are grateful for. Yes. So, for here, this was definitely, as I said, a very different film for Miyazaki. Because a lot of the ones he has seen had more of a fantasy element to them. Mm -hmm. This one was more based in reality. The only thing that was, like, basically fantasy was the fact that the main character had been turned <laughs> into a pig. Right. That's really the fantasy part of it. But for some, somehow, it still managed to capture your attention because you want to find out how do you get turned into a pig. Because they show you... Not the film, how he looked and how he would have looked human, mm -hmm. but something happened in one of his adventures and he woke up and he turned into a, a anthro pig. And everyone just accepts that he's no longer a man and now he's a pig. Right. That I, was also pretty fantastical. Right. <laughs> At first you think, okay, maybe they think it's a costume or something. Like, no, they, they know he's a pig, but they just say that dang pig. <laughs> <laughs> and yes, there are a bunch of pork jokes in here before you ask. <laughs> yes. Now, first, I just want to, us to mention the dynamic cast they had. Lead role, Porco Rosso, voiced by Michael Keaton. Mm -hmm. Susan Egan as Gina. And we had Brad Garrett as the one of the bosses of the Air Pirates. Also, Patrick Starr, Bill Fagerbaki. Yes. And Kevin Michael Richardson. And Frank and, Welker. Yes. And then we also had... Um, David Austin stares as Grandpa Rosso. Right. And we also had D. Bradley Baker. Or we had like background voices from uh, D. Bradley Baker, mm -hmm. Michael Bell, Jeff Bennett, Cameron Bone, Roger Bumpass, Corey Burton, Debbie Derryberry, and Tom Kitty! Don't forget Paul Eating. Yes, and Brian George. And you, yes, yes, and, and Tress McNeil. Yes, and, and Lorraine Paul's Newman. And Lorraine Newman and Phil Proctor. And Jim Ward. They were just all, like an all-star cast, both for acting and voice acting, and ones who are in both. Yes, and we also forgot to mention Kimberly Williams Paisley as Flo. Was it Flo? I think so. Yeah, the girl. Yes. Yeah. So... Now that you know all the dynamic stars that made this voiceover fantastic, let's get into Porco Rosso. Right. So in the here, red pig. right, it's exactly what it means. Now for here, like we said, it's not so much as fancy as it was reality. Most of the stories Miyazaki. Uh, films have is that it's in reality but there's a fantasy feel to it or it's a mixture of both mm -hmm. and some leads towards more fantasy than reality mm -hmm. and here it went in a, a different direction as it wanted to appeal more to adults so it went with a more harder pressed uh, storyline and setting having to do with one of the wars mm -hmm. and the only, like I said the only fantasy part was that he was turned into a pig and everyone was <laughs> fine with that. They right. do explain later in the film what happened and why uh when he turned into this form, and it's sort of it's sort of vague. I guess the audience is supposed to figure out like it was something he didn't do that wasn't noble, and that was sort of like a punishment. We don't know from what. And it's like he was supposed he had a friend who was also an air pilot, and they were in battle with these pirates, and he didn't help him, or he ran away. And it looks like that was the punishment for doing that. He became was a coward for doing that, mm -hmm. and he had turned into that form. And he just didn't grasp on to on that was the reason why he did it because there was kind of this sense of, uh, as they mentioned in the film, like Prince and the Frog, like if he redeems himself or something, would he turn back into a human or, right. is, just, or is he stuck like this forever? You're not sure by the end of the movie, but they do give you kind of hints that maybe he did finally turn back. Right. And this movie actually takes place, well, not the time period, but this movie was... Distributed, put out in originally in 1992. Yeah, and it got rated very highly, 7.7 7 out of 10. Right. I think it should have gotten a higher score, but hey. Right. But it actually takes place in the early 1930s. Right. And so you see 
the dress was kind of um, ambiguous because the dress, the clothing didn't really look like 1930s clothing. Right, it's sort of like a mini mixture. Right. As usually with his films, it's sort of like it's not quite in the past, it's not quite in modern day. There's always some sort of in-between thing he has, like with Kiki's Delivery Service. Mm -hmm. And then he had a rivalry going on with the character uh, Donald Curtis. Mm -hmm. He was his, um, yeah, he was his rival. Not only in flying, but with the ladies. Right. And it was hilarious. <laughs> and you couldn't believe it. It's like, you're going to choose that pig over me? Yes. Like, well, the way you act, and you're kind of a douchebag. So, yes, the pig is actually a better option. <laughs> he wanted to go to Hollywood. <laughs> also, the language was a little different in this movie. Pretty much, you don't have any... Uh, swearing in usually in Miyazaki movies, right. you have that beautiful atmosphere. You have the, of course, the the painting and the backdrop and everything is just, as you say, pure fantasy. But in this one, with the realism, you also got some realism in the language that was used. Right now, there isn't like you know a bunch of violence or. R-rated stuff or anything happening in right, there. We get right. that the, it's in this time period of war, but you don't see any casualties or anything like that in here. Right. More of the detail went into the planes, as Miyazaki was a, is a huge uh, planes fan in terms of you know the building, the mechanics of it, the designs, and the flying. Mm -hmm. So instead of having the landscape, they had a very basic landscape, but still great to look at, while a lot more in the animation went into the planes and the details and the characteristics in there and how they match up with their pilots. Like with uh, Porco's constantly needing repairs because he's this only plane he'll ever fly. So it kind of looks banged up a lot. Right. And you got to see a lot more about the people, and I was saying here as well, mm -hmm. the people he dealt with that worked at the, um, the auto place, right? Yes. Yeah, Utah. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. You had to see more of the people that he had the relationships with. And as you said, it was a little more grittier than normally a film goes. Right. Miyazaki. Right. And Michael Keaton was great as Rosa. He was great as right. Rosa. And we were kind of surprised when we looked at the case, like all these big stars, which they usually have, but sometimes you're still surprised, like, oh my gosh, they're in a Miyazaki film. Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh, they're in an anime film. Oh my gosh, we're in this movie. <laughs> well, I think I like best about Keaton is that he didn't overplay the role and he didn't underplay it. It was just the right, right. amount of personality and gumption and toughness that was needed for the character. Right. And it worked perfectly and in um, relating to the other voice actors, it just seemed to really flow. Right. The conversations, the dialogue, everything just really worked. And as you said, it was more it was different from a typical Miyazaki film, but in that aspect, it really worked the same as the fan the fan, more the ones that are more fantasy than realism. Yeah, it had that same dialogue and smoothness and interplay of the characters, and it worked really really well. And the voice actors right. were cast perfect, and they still had lots of humor in it, like his other movies, which yes. is which is great. So like we said, they don't focus on because of the time period. They don't focus on just the doom and gloom and the weary stuff. There's no casualties or anything like that. This is just the setting. This is what the character is. And that is it. That is about as much realism as you get without it being like too much where younger kids can't watch it. Right. So it's still, you know, watch it with your family. But Definitely. it is the gear is, they, as they say, it shifts toward a little more towards adults because it would be the type of movies they would watch or what they it would be in the films they would watch. Definitely. And it was actually released in USA in 1994. It spans an hour and 34 minutes. Now, for me, I did like the movie, but unlike when I've watched other Miyazaki films where I get lost in the movie mm -hmm. and then it's the end and I go, it's over already, and you go, but well, mom, it was two hours or over two hours. Mm -hmm. This time, I was aware of the time. And because of that, I would have to say I like the other films I've seen better. Which it's is not fine. that I dislike it, mm -hmm. but as far as the... The fantasy portion of it right. that takes me away, I really love that about his films. Right. And I like that he did something different, showed us a different side of his talent, a different side of what he wanted to write, right. and just 
a different character in general. Right. It's great. And I still would recommend that anyone who's a Miyazaki fan, who's new to his films, or who just hasn't seen this film, definitely see it. Right. And one more thing I definitely want to add is that, as you said, this movie was made in, what, 94? It was made in 92, but it came out in the U.S. in 94. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, it looks like as the movies progress, the time period started to change and the themes started to change. It still had all of them there. But what it shifted towards was starting to shift towards more reality, but without being so hard pressed in reality, it doesn't feel fun to watch. Because you think about Ponyo, mm -hmm. and you think about the last film they made before they closed, Sequel of Arietti. Mm -hmm. Both of them were pretty much in modern day, right. or and still had the fancy element. Ponyo had, you know, with the fish, and based off of Little Mermaid, that was your fancy element in modern day. Arietti, it was very modern in the say and everything, but the fancy came from Arietti. Mm -hmm. So it started to shift towards, okay, it's in the modern, it was the set of fantasy world with fantasy settings and fancy characters. They started having a modern day setting with a fantasy theme to it. Mm -hmm. So looks like this was the start of that new shift, but it still works in terms of not uh, changing what made Miyazaki film Absolutely. work anyway. Absolutely. So if you've seen this movie and you love it, let us know in the comments below. And if it's, let us know if it's something you hope that he makes something similar to this again. Mm -hmm. Or if you're more a fan of the fan to see more like films like Mama is. Right. And be sure to like, subscribe, and click the notification bell to get updates on future Pause podcasts and World of Pause videos. And more Miyazaki movies. So thank you so much for watching. We are very grateful for you. I'm Masco Entertainment. And I'm Mama Entertainment. Have a fantastic day. Peace. In the mountaintops, rivers, and streams. Plucking sunlight from the sky in my pocket. Give it to you later on in the form of a locket.